Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all of you, depending on which part of the world you reside in. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on Vipassana meditation and transformational change. I'm pleased to share that we have registrations from over 21 countries across the world besides India, from Argentina to Angola to Australia. My name is Shakti Saran and I stand for oneness with humanity and harmony with mother nature. I am the founder of a think tank called Shaktify and I've previously worked in both the corporate and the nonprofit sector. In the world that we live in, our eyes and ears are mostly filled by accomplishments in the corporate sector, the social and the public sectors, whether it is an announcement of a new vaccine to deal with a pandemic like COVID-19, whether it's a technological fix or unveiling of new ESG promises to manage our climate crisis, or whether it is the remarkable work that nonprofits do in the densely diverse space that constitutes the social sector, more often than not, root causes of the maladies of our times are ignored. The main objective of this webinar is to understand the value of Vipassana meditation as a transformation tool. And when I say a transformation tool, I refer to the trinity of transformation, which includes personal self-transformation, societal and business transformation, and planetary transformation. If you recall, some of you would recall that Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Can there be terrorism or war without hatred? Can we face financial crises without corruption and greed? Can irresponsible behavior like drug abuse and crime take place without ignorance? What will make this webinar successful is if it leaves you, dear participants, with heightened realization of how one can discover the root causes of our personal and social ills and use that to transform our lives. I am indeed privileged to present to you Bharat Grover and Aditya Natraj, two wonderful souls in this discussion today. Uh, Bharat Grover is an accomplished Vipassana teacher of the SN Goenka School of Vipassana Meditation and has taught every single format of this meditation program. In India, there is this tradition to attach a suffix called G, spelt J-I, to the names of your teachers and elders. Uh, Bharaji did his first 10-day meditation program, if I'm not mistaken, in his 20s, and has built up his practice from there. He is a management consultant by profession and is the director of Vernalis Consulting. He's a strong supporter of several social causes. He is a graduate in physics from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and a postgraduate in physics from IIT Madras. Bharatji was the Vipassana teacher who presided when I took my first 10-day program. It was his guidance that helped me navigate the 10-day course. What appeals to me most about him is the sense of clarity and equanimity with which he speaks. Uh, he remains a guide to me as I try and deepen my practice. Aditya Natraj is a former corporate sector professional who transitioned to the social sector when retirement was not even on his horizon. I met Aditya first some five years ago at a social sector conference where I got to learn of the amazing work his foundation has been doing in education and now several other areas such as health and women empowerment. Early in a social sector career, Aditya set up the Gandhi Fellowship, a flagship program of the Piramal Foundation where he serves as its CEO. This is a two-year program to develop a cater of leaders exposed to the complexities of bringing change in social and public systems. All Gandhi Fellows are required to undertake a 10-day Vipassana program. What appeals to me most about Aditya is not just his audacious vision, but the quiet and unassuming way in which he goes about executing it. Bharatji and Aditya, welcome to this webinar. Thank you for accepting my request too, and I'm really honored to have you here today. A little bit about my own meditation journey. Uh, I started doing a base form of Vipassana meditation called Anapana, which some of you may have heard, you know, for those of you who joined before 6.30 India. This was almost 30 years ago and was longing to undertake the 10-day program, but it took me a lot of time and a lot of preparation and courage in I'd be able to complete a 10-day program without prematurely exiting. I felt ready in 2011 and made three attempts to join a Vipassana program, 
These were unsuccessful because of work-related challenges. It was then that a collaboration program from another school, which I ended up doing and which resulted in a long detour before I got back onto the path of Vipassana. I know we have many people here today from different schools, such as Transcendental Meditation, Vedic Meditation, Mindfulness, and, e and Reiki Healing. So one of the caveats I wish to state up front is that Vipassana is not the only avenue available for self-realization and transformation. I have chosen Vipassana only out of a personal choice. We don't have the time to make comparisons between different techniques. So for those who are non-Vipassana meditators, do note that there exists some common ground, if not a perfect overlap, in terms of benefits of different what we're going to do now in, in about two minutes from now is to conduct a short single poll. It's just one question and it's multiple choice. This poll is just so that our panelists, to help them gauge the meditation profile of Thereafter, we will get into the main session where I will be posing a set of questions to Bharati and Aditya. The main session comprises of one preliminary question on the Vipassana practice, followed by four modules. And these modules are the individual journeys of each of our panelists, the value of Vipassana as experienced by each panelist within their direct sphere of influence, the value of Vipassana, number three, the value of Vipassana as a broader transformation tool, which might extend to beyond this, the, uh, the direct sphere of their influence, general discussion. Uh, we have decided to do something different today from what is traditionally done in webinars. Uh, we gave our registrants an option to pose questions to our panelists at the time of registration, and we have been overwhelmed by the response. So instead of having one block of audience questions at the back end, we have interspersed audience questions with every module. Now, for those of you who did not pose a question at the time of registration and would like to do so now, please feel free to do so using the Q&A box and not the general chat. I will try my best to weave these with the flow of our webinar. Before I get started, I wish to bring out the main intent of this webinar was to establish the connection between Vipassana meditation and transformational change. And not so much as to discuss the technique and its philosophical underlyings. But we observed that we have received many questions in this area. We have therefore retained some questions for the last module, which is the general section. For those of you whose questions do not get answered, Bharatji has created a group on Telegram and has kindly offered to answer any leftover questions or any subsequent questions that may come up later. I am posting this in the chat right now, the link to the, the, the Telegram group. In case you would like to join, please feel free to do so. And if any question that gets uh, that's unanswered, or if you subsequently have a question, please feel free to post it in that Telegram group. Yeah, I have also put in the chat that uh, for all of you in different parts of the world, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, your name and where you're calling from today. So let's get started with the with the poll. As I said, we just have you know only one uh, one poll, one quiz, and I'm going to launch that right now. So the question the question is 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 about your meditation profile. Uh, please tell us about your engagement with meditation. Select one or more of the options, and you can have multiple choice out here. I'm a meditator and practice Vipassana. I'm a meditator and practice other forms of meditation or self-realization. I am not a meditator. All right, so we have uh, the bulk of the responses come in. So 40% of the, the uh, people here on this on this uh, webinar today are not meditators. And 
33, 33%, uh, the number is changing, is about 33% are Vipassana meditators. And that leaves about another 30% uh, who are who, who practice other forms of meditation or self-realization. Right, so that's the approximate uh, you know figure that we that we have. Forty percent of uh, our participants today are not meditators. About thirty three percent are meditators of Vipass and in the of, of vipassana, and thirty two percent are meditators who practice other forms of. Meditation. be some vipassana meditators who also uh, you know carry out other forms of meditation right so i'm going to end the poll and we're going to get into our main into our main session So we're going to get started, and I thought it, it was just going to be useful because we have so many people here today who are non-Vipassana meditators, or even many forms of meditation, that we just begin with one single question, you know, about the practice itself. So I'm just going to request uh, Bharaji uh, to step in here, and uh, Bharaji, this is a question for you in about three minutes or so, if you can tell us. Now, you have been a Vipassana meditator for several years. Please, can you in some educate us what meditation is all about for the benefit of our audience here today? Thanks, Shaktiji. Uh, I came to Vipassana quite accidentally. I was practicing several other forms of meditation before I discovered Vipassana. One of my family friends, who was a professor of computer science in IIT Bombay, Professor Rajinder Kumar, introduced me to Vipassana, and I'm very grateful to him for that. What I found uh, about Vipassana was that it was a very simple technique of observing the mind-body continuum. It started with observing the breath, and just a natural breath as it comes in, as it goes out. And using this tool of breath observation, it helped me sharpen my mind. As this mind sharpened, I was able to discover many truths about the mind-body connection. For example, if there was a thought of anger, then my body would uh, be filled with certain kind of sensations. If there was a positive thought of happiness or goodwill or compassion, my body would be filled with different kind of sensations. And I could see the mind-body connection very clearly. And therefore, I discovered that the root cause of stress in my body, the root cause of uh, heaviness in my body was very strongly linked to my mind and my current state of thinking and thoughts. This was uh, a very powerful experiential reality which uh, has guided my uh, journey in life from uh, from the first course 27 years ago to today and it is constantly uh, constantly guiding me into becoming a better human being this self-awareness of what I am doing moment to moment is very helpful to course correction this in sum is uh, with what Vipassana meditation is all about all right, thank you, thank you very much, Bharaji. So you also answered part of the follow-on question that I had for you. So I'm going to now move to uh, to Aditya, and Aditya, can you share with us, you know, tell us more about your vipassana journey and how did it come about and how has it benefited you personally? Thank you, Shakti. Um, it's wonderful to be here with Bharat. Uh, I feel like I'm batting with Virat Kohli on the other side of the thing, and I'm like a fresher, uh, you know, eight standard boy who's uh, uh, playing the runner just for fun. So uh, I started my journey also 20 years ago. Uh, 
uh, first time I went for Vipassana, my mentor, Mr. Vagul uh, from ICICI Bank, uh, he saw that I was generally very unhappy with the state of affairs in the world around me and the injustice around me. And instead of recommending, and I told him I wanted to do something about it. And uh, instead of recommending that I go and do something about it, he told me go to Vipassana. Didn't make any sense to me. I thought he would tell me go to LSC, study, uh, go to the village, do something, do some hartal. He said, no, go to Vipassana. And that was, uh, I didn't quite understand it at that time, but probably one of the most important advice anybody has ever given me. Uh, because our projection of what is happening in the world outside is merely because of what is happening inside. Uh, and that's how my journey started. I experimented with uh, many different types of meditation. I tried heartfulness. I tried uh, Sadhguru's meditation. I tried art of living. I tried uh, cognitive-based compassion uh, therapy. So I tried different forms of meditation. And I still am a practitioner. I mean, depending on what I feel like that morning, uh, I, I choose uh, different forms of meditation. Uh, but all of them are basically, the main thing it has helped is just internal peace and calm of mind. Um, I think uh, I just feel very, very happy every day. And it almost feels unfair to feel this happy, but uh, uh, I just feel very, very happy on the inside. So <laughs> it's like, uh, what joy. Uh, so that's why I do it. It's extremely for the self. Wow, that's that's really powerful, Aditya. Thank you. So please uh, stay on, Aditya. This is a follow-on question, and this question is actually for both you and and Bharaji. So the follow-on question, and actually this is an audience question, uh, and it's it's a question that has come from Praveen Sengar, uh, who is the CEO of Etec International. He's based in Colombia, and the question is a very pertinent question. And how did you continue practicing while being in a leadership position? So you started your meditation 20 years ago and you know you very soon assumed leadership position. So how how did that how have you made that happen? And you know, can you can you share that with your story with, with everyone here today? So I actually will flip the question around. Saying, how do you manage your leadership position without being Vipassana? Um, because uh, I find it very difficult to do it without doing Vipassana or something. I think leadership positions are extremely onerous or can be perceived as onerous by the mind. If one doesn't have a tool to actually calm the mind and see that we're just all random fragments of carbon just floating around in the planet. So don't get too serious about it. And uh, uh, just do the work that you need to do. So I don't know how being in a leadership position, I mean, I don't know which came first. I think if you do the Vipassana, you might be in a leadership position, you might not, but you just do the leader, you just do the Vipassana. Uh, I think it's extremely difficult to be in leadership positions. I see so many of my friends who are in senior positions and stressed and smoking and uh, drinking and trying to find different vents. I just wish they would find peace in other ways uh, from the stresses that they're going through. So even a 10-minute Hanapana helps so much, like the 10 minutes that you just played before this. Right, um, right. Because, you know, you've been working from 8 o'clock in the morning at 6 o'clock suddenly to just have that 10 minutes suddenly helps in spite of whatever you've done. At least that's my experience. I right. can't do my current role without this. That is very, very insightful. You founded a consulting firm. You you have a you know a big consulting setup. Uh, how do you how have you managed to you know continue practicing whilst being in a leadership position? And given given how caught up everyone is in today's uh, in today's world. I think uh, Shakti there are two parts to this answer. One is. I just want to build on what the beautiful answer that Aditya gave, that uh, it is actually very difficult to navigate uh, life without Vipassana or without some kind of meditation. And it's it's almost like driving a car without having a brake or an accelerator or a steering. And uh, unless we are able to control the reaction that happens to all the 
triggers that keep coming and are thrown at us, we lead a very uncontrolled and wild life. And there comes a time when, you, when you're disgusted with yourself for having done all of that. Uh, you know, maybe you scream at a subordinate, maybe you scream at a vendor, and you realize actually over time that it was not them, it was you and your lack of control which is causing that. So it's an accident. I mean, we may not recognize it as an accident, but because there's no physicality to it at times, but there is, uh, there is damage. So if you really are in positions of power, you're like a big truck and you can cause a lot of damage. The more you are able to see that, the more you are uh, propelled towards uh, control, towards uh, purification, to becoming a better human. So that's one part of the answer. How do you really find time to do it? The more you recognize the importance, that's one part of it. But even those who find or who would say that this is the most important thing in my life, it is still an extremely, extremely difficult thing to get up and to sit on the meditation cushion, which is just a few feet away. That is among the biggest challenges. I would feel it would be equivalent to climbing more Mount Everest or even more because the mind rebels. And, you know, 27 years later, I, it still rebels having to get up and sit on that cushion, uh, wanting to observe my breath. Once I sit down and I say, okay, fine, I'm going to sit for 10 minutes. Let me offer a minute. Once I manage to reach that cushion and sit down, uh, I'm able to go for a longer period, but that journey is a very difficult journey. So uh, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of persistence to beguile this very, very smart mind, which keeps giving you excuses. Hey, how about this particular pending work or that particular urgent stuff? Why don't we close that and come back to this later? So it will prioritize everything and deprioritize your meditation. That's been my experience and also the experience of many others who meditate. Uh, so it is, Praveen, it's a very difficult uh, a journey, but you get there. I mean, persistence and, and not giving up gets you there. So so basically what you're saying is this is uh, realization. If one can, it's, uh, and self-realization is not always easy, but if there is that realization, then that can be a big mot motivator to get and sit, uh, to get one to to get up and sit on that mat. That, so that's what you're saying. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. That is very very insightful, Bharati. So we're going to now we've finished the first section, which is about your personal journeys, and we're now going to extend this conversation on uh, uh, you know the practice of vipassana. Uh, within patients that you work for, the people that you've come in contact with. Uh, so that is going to be the next set of questions. And uh, the first question that I have is uh, is for, there's a few questions that have been lined up for Aditya and then for you, uh, uh, later for you, uh, uh, Bharati. So the question for Aditya is, and this is a question, it's an audience question. Uh, it's from... Uh, Gopinath Patra from the Gandhi ship, uh, you know, uh, from the fellowship. And uh, I've, in, I've actually blended this with my own question that I had for you. So the question I have for you is that you are the founder of the Gandhi fellowships, uh, the flagship program of the Piramal mm -hmm. Foundation. What made you make Vipassana meditation, uh, the meditation program a requirement for Gandhi fellows? And what has its impact been on youth and how is how is this program evolving? Yeah, Shakti. So when we started the fellowship in 2008, uh, we started uh, with a problem statement. There are several masters in social work programs which already existed in the country, which, you know, train people much better than we could ever imagine. Uh, and there are several rural management courses also that are available. Uh, right. Then, of course, there are many sociology, political science courses also available, which are policy, public policy courses available in the country. Uh, at least, and I had, uh, in my previous role, recruited several people from these social work, rural management, public policy courses. At least what I learned uh, from them and from reading 
is that ultimately at the base of all this is your values and what you believe and how you interpret the world. There is nothing that is right or wrong. Unfortunately, Donald Trump can also be right and Joe Biden can also be right. Congress can also be right and BJP can also be right. Uh, and so ultimately, it comes down to your values and you. And therefore, that self-awareness. So if you went into a particular, if you went to JNU, then you believed a particular truth. Uh, and you went to London School of Economics and you believed that something else was a truth. And that sort of didn't add up for me. You know, like, how can it be a truth just because you went for three years to one institution? And uh, so I think it's very important for each individual to find her own truth. And that was very critical portion for anyone who is in development. Uh, and before developing others, the first thing is to know your own truth. And uh, from amongst the initial founding group of seven, eight of us, most of us had benefited disproportionately from Vipassana. And uh, so we just said that, boss, this is very critical. I mean, after all, every course has its bunch of uh, compulsory courses. You do your MBA and, you know, strategy is compulsory, finance is compulsory. You do Gandhi Fellowship, Vipassana is one of the compulsory elements uh, within that. That's how we sort of looked at it because being aware of yourself is very critical to being able to interpret the world around you. So, so I get what you're saying, Aditya, but uh, just a follow-on question for you. Have there been any unintended consequences of making this program mandatory? And uh, the reason I ask you, because I've come across... Uh, uh, people who've been Gandhi fellows and uh, I've heard of stories, okay, these are only stories and this is just hearsay of people who have, uh, you know, uh, young fellows who actually smuggled in snacks into the Vipassana program because they, they just dread the thought of uh, doing a 10-day program. So can you just share some light on, you know, making this mandatory? What if you were to do difference? Yeah, you know, this is like, uh, even if you run um, a program at uh, Stephen's or at JNU, there are certain courses that are compulsory, but no one is asking you to come to JNU. Before you come to JNU, you already know that you have to do economics, uh, right? You can't come to JNU and then say, but I don't want to do the compulsory course in economics. No one asked you to come to JNU. No one is forcing you to come to the Gandhi Fellowship. So I don't understand this concept of mandatory. This is part right. of the courses. You want to pass 12 standard, yeah. you have to give a few six subjects. You can't say, why are there six subjects? I want only two subjects. Uh, some things in life we can change. Some things we have to accept. You don't want to do it. You can. There are several other fellowships which don't believe self-awareness is important. This is part of it. There's another process where you have to live in a community with 50 rupees for a month. It's Correct. a community immersion and that's also a compulsory process. These are critical processes for self-awareness that we believe like, are important. Right. Right. So right. I don't believe I don't believe the Gandhi Fellowship is mandatory. This is one of the compulsory courses. All right. Uh, if you're going to have, if you're going to have the responsibility as a young person to inflict your views on people around you, you have great responsibility to first understand where your views are coming from. And you need tools to understand those views, to still your mind. And I think otherwise it is dangerous. We will only cause more harm to people around us. Right, right. right. So, so I'm, there I'm are unintended okay. consequences. You're right. Some people have smuggled it in, but that's the same as someone goes into an eco paper uh, at uh, Delhi School of Economics and, you know, cheats in that paper. There will always hmm. be people like that. I mean, all our minds are feeble. Um, I also, the first time I went to Vipassana, I took a uh, book with me and I took a notepad with me and I cheated and I wrote because for me, my mind was just exploding. Um, but I needed to write uh, because my way of emptying my mind is to write. Now I don't need to do that. But when I went, I needed to. So I think it's fine. As a 21-year-old, at least they're experiencing it. And even with the snack, they're persisting through it. I give them huge credit for that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm aware of your community immersion program. I think it's, it's very novel. I, I don't know of any other program that has something like what you have, uh, what the Gandhi Fellowship has come up with. And what you also just spoke about a little while ago is, is you've really brought out the, the significance of, uh, you know, looking at and observing multiple perspectives. 
And uh, the perspective, a leader who is a perspectivist leader, a perspectivist is is probably at the very peak of the whole uh, leadership ladder. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that out. That's that's uh, very very interesting. There's one more question for you, uh, Aditya, and this has come from Andrea Revel. She's a UK-based author, and I see that Nitisha Agar Agrawal in uh, has also posed a similar question, and that is the question that she's asked is, how can we encourage meditation in schools? I can't imagine a better gift we could give our children. And since, you know, your initial work was so extensively in the education space, can you just share a little bit on, on this on to answer this question? Yeah, I think uh, there are two, three barriers, right? One, first of all, I mean, so I completely agree meditation is required in schools. My own children, I try to encourage them to do this rather than teach math. But there is a there is an overall thing that math is compulsory, but somehow training the mind is not compulsory. I don't, I'm not able to understand how the world landed up at that truth. Uh, that learning language and reading is compulsory, but uh, but Vipassana is not compulsory. I don't know how we made those choices, right? Geography and learning about rocks is compulsory, but learning about the mind is, and your own emotions and your heart-mind connections is not compulsory. So I don't know how we arrived at those truths uh, for ourselves and we made it... Uh, so I think there are multiple reasons why it gets resisted. One is it's perceived as religious. Uh, so I don't know why it gets, why is math not a religion and why is this a religion? I'm not able to figure out uh, as yet. So there will be people who resist it because it's religion. Uh, I think there are so many techniques that are not religion. So, you know, so I don't see the problem with that. Uh, but I think people have found ways in now, you know, mindfulness is allowed in, I think, so many schools, even in the U.S. In fact, paradoxically, India is doing less than the U.S. or Western countries for mindfulness, right, uh, inside its own schools. Uh, and uh, social, emotional and ethical learning is another way in which it has been brought into schools. So I think in different ways, we are having to fight uh, this battle that math and language are fundamental skills, uh, but controlling our own mind is not a fundamental skill. Uh, and being having control over one's mind, I think, is a fundamental skill because, like, otherwise, like Bharat said, you're in charge of a truck and you can go and ram anybody. And that's such a dangerous thing. I think it's just humanity's current consciousness is at this level. Hopefully, with more and more, uh, we are all realizing how critical this is. And I feel very positive that. Hopefully, my grandchildren, this will just be like, you know, just standard for my grandchildren that you obviously have to do this sort of thing in your school. Um, like you have to do maths and language tests uh, and you have to do math and language class. There has to be meditation in the school. I think it'll, within the next two generations, I think it will be part of the everyone across the world. Or we'll self-destruct one of the two. <laughs> my own experience is that uh, Vipassana is yeah, so... Yeah, I've been on this. A little. I just wanted to come in on this. Please, please. So, Atit, that's a very, very insightful point that you brought about. Why is it that, you know, math is essential and meditation is optional or not essential? And I feel we need to go back to uh, the route which, uh, if we explore, will give us a lot of answers. And I'm sure you know these answers as well. There's a lot of templated thinking that is happening on education, even from the very word education, what it means. And the origin of a lot of this education was in apprenticeship, uh, making you ready for a profession or for job skills. And eventually, as we went beyond apprenticeship, we really forgot the core purpose of education. We never asked. Second, most of our, for bulk of the time, we've not really known of neutral or secular meditation techniques. Most of the time, we've associated meditation with religion. So, Secular techniques like observe, breath observation or, you know, Vipassana being unknown, there was no chance to integrate them with some form of education. As educators uh, are becoming, as people are going through Vipassana programs and recognizing the importance and the phenomenal value that these can contribute and they're becoming educators or, you know, important government officials, education is... Uh, is being re-looked at and meditation is being integrated. The Mitra Upakran program that was launched by Maharashtra government, I think, under Ratnakar Gaikwadji, who was the chief secretary of Maharashtra, 
today there are 10,000, maybe more than 10,000 schools in Maharashtra where Anapan has been integrated, daily Anapan has been integrated. Just a few days back, I heard that the Assam government has taken this up. There's a website on Mitra Upakram and uh, it's a it's become a daily life, the, the results and how this has impacted the scholastic ability of students is all well documented. So I'm, I'm very happy to share that even in India and gradually this awareness about meditation, its importance and integration with education with daily with academic curriculum is happening. But but you're right that there's a long way for us to go before it becomes mainstream and, you know, the central pillar around which education is organized. Thank, thank you both. This is, uh, you know, for unearthing and also it's uh, what both of you have said is is just makes is very meaningful. It makes a lot of sense. So at least uh, what I hear you saying, Bharati, is that we've got the ball rolling and, uh, and you know, perhaps this this idea might just pick up. And as uh, Aditya said that, in, you know, at the, at, for his grandchildren, this just may become the standard or may become the, the routine. So fingers crossed. Let's uh, let's. Uh, you know, hope for that. And so I'm moving on to, uh, as part of the same session, Bharji, to some questions which are in uh, the realm of business. And uh, these are some questions for you. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind our audience today, if there's anybody who has a question, please put it in the Q&A box because I'm unable to monitor the chat right now. So if there are any questions, I'd only, be ha I'd only have visibility if you put it in the Q&A box. Yeah. All right, so coming back to you, Bharati, you know, there are, I know of a couple of business entities. Uh, there's uh, Puducherry based STEM land, and, you know, there's one or two more that I know of. And then there's uh, outfits like uh, ESDS software solutions that, uh, you know, make it, uh, that provide their employees with a 10 day Vipassana leave. And then, uh, you know, entities like uh, STEM land uh, make it mandatory again for their employees to go through a 10-day Vipassana meditation program. Even in your own setup in Vernalis Consulting, I remember in one of our conversations some time ago, you had mentioned that every every partner, every consultant, every employee of Vernalis Consulting is, uh, you know, is a Vipassana practitioner. So what is it about Vipassana that makes, uh, you know, many business, uh, business leaders encourage or or mandate this practice from a strictly from a business uh, perspective. What is it about this practice that that makes it uh, that encourage that you know that leads to so many people you know uh, encouraging their employees to take on this practice? So I will I will hold back on the mandatory bit. I'll stay with the benefits. If, okay, uh, all right. If or any any organization is mandating it. Uh, I have myself mandated it in in Burnless and now I have stepped back from mandating it. We encourage people to go for Vipassana. And okay. uh, it, why does it benefit or why do we uh, strongly recommend it? There are many, many obvious uh, advantages. I'm sure you would realize that the better your awareness and the better your focus, these have a direct connection with productivity. If my mind is very distracted and, you know, constantly wandering away, I'm incapable of taking up and solving any big or complex problem. So certainly there's a strong connection between your awareness and focus levels and your productivity. But I, I feel that uh, apart from this very obvious answer, uh, which and which, by the way, also gives you like manifold returns. I mean, your awareness and focus do not just improve by a few percentage points, it there's a multiple, maybe 2x, 5x, depending upon the extent of your practice, the benefits are enormous. But the least benefit is also significant. Uh, this we have observed. So that's one obvious reason for recommending this program. But there are some not so obvious reasons. One of them is Vipassana teaches you detachment. Now, at a very obvious level, at a very superficial level, it seems that detachment is the very opposite of what a businessman should be doing. Because, you know, you're wanting to achieve some goals and go go get it. But detachment is fundamental to perspective. I think some somewhere down the line, you, you know, a few minutes ago, you were talking about perspective being a perspectivist being at the top of uh, the hierarchy or the pyramid of leadership. 
and it, I, I may or may not agree with that, but I certainly would say that perspective is very fundamental to leadership. And you, the moment you are attached with a concept, a notion, an entity, you start coming closer and you tend to lose perspective on what's happening. With every round of Vipassana, with every time you sit and meditate, it brings some degree of detachment. And the more detached you are, let's say the closer I am to a wall, the lesser portion of the wall I'm able to focus on and see. But as I step back from the wall, I'm able to get a wider perspective on the issue. Vipassana brings detachment and that detachment brings perspective. And perspective is fundamental to sensible decision-making, objective decision-making. So it's a return which is phenomenal, a return on investment which is phenomenal. You would not be able to conceptualize so many things. Your vision would be compromised if you did not have perspective and your perspective is compromised with attachment. So to that extent, uh, Vipassana is fundamental on multiple, multiple realms, multiple, multiple dimensions. I have talked of a few. I can talk much more, but back to you. Thank you. That was uh, an amazing insight. I never thought about it. it it's uh, you know the connection between uh, detachment and uh, and and perspectives, and then uh, you know further linking perspectives to leadership. So that is like uh, it's it's a great insight. Thank you very much. Uh, sticking with you, uh, Bharaji, uh, The next question uh, is on uh, again in the business realm. I've heard a lot of stories about you know Vipassana being a helping in in organization transformation so can you dwell a little bit more on on you know on the organization part how businesses are organized is there some way in which uh, vipassana you know can can sort of help indeed uh, from uh, our own experience within vernless and in working with organizations outside the moment you have uh, many people together and many intelligent people together, they're bound to have differences in viewpoints. And the very purpose of a you know of accumulating or collecting a team is to bring diversity because diversity brings diversity of perspectives. And collectively, we are able to have a more powerful perspective. But the moment you get different different perspectives, you start to have disputes or at least at the very least uh, disagreements if we are not wise and aware we tend to escalate disagreements into disputes and disputes into conflicts and i mean you would recognize the moment there's a conflict you're operating at at such a diminished capacity all the time, the conflict holds you and has sway over you. You're constantly reacting inside. It, it, you know, it uh, occupies your entire bandwidth. So, how do we escape conflict, remaining uh, within in the midst of so many people, uh, so many intelligent beings? And that is the dilemma. As the organization grows, you have more people, more intelligent people and therefore more chance of disharmony and conflict. I think that is where Vipassana comes in uh, very, very fundamentally and very beautifully. And all the organizations that we worked with over the long term on organizational change and transformation, there are phenomenal benefits. You can see testimonials on our website where you will see that uh, harmony is a word that enters the lexicon in a big way. It's it's not just conflict resolution as a formal process. It's harmony as a way of living, moment to moment, uh, correcting, course correcting, uh, not waiting for it to escalate into a conflict. Your awareness helps you discover or discern that, hey, this argument is going in a direction which will lead to conflict. Let me course correct now. Let me course correct now. So eventually, as you are more and more self-aware, more and more immersed with uh, uh, with thoughts of compassion, with thoughts of goodwill, with thoughts of uh, positivity, you are uh, not avoiding conflict, you are nipping conflict in the blood. There is no chance for conflict to emerge and, uh, you know, catch you unaware. This is how uh, people with different ideas can work together. I can pick what I think is good from you, pick what is good from the other. And collectively, this idea is far more powerful than any individual idea. 
And of course, that is fundamental to good organizations. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very enriching answer. I'm going to move on to the the third part of the third module that we have uh, to offer today, which is Vipassana as a broader transformation tool. Uh, and I have a couple of questions for uh, both of you. I'm okay. going to start. Why didn't we ask Aditya for his view? I'm sure he's also had, he's heading a large organization. I'm sure he has a view on this. Very similar, Bharat. I think it's not just, it's the connections between human beings, right? Uh, because instead of conflict, if you go to the other extreme, you said harmony, we look at it as connection. What is the human experience? If I don't feel connected to the person sitting on the desk, desk next to me, what is the point of life? Because I'm going to spend more time with her than I'm going to spend with my own wife or my children. And... Uh, unnecessary conflict, fighting, it's just toxic work environments, extremely uh, patriarchal, toxic work environments we seem to have accepted. I don't feel they are valuable at all. Uh, so much more fun. Na? Every day you get positive energy from people around you. So, But that requires each of us to recognize that whatever we are causing is inside ourselves. That's all. All right. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you both. That is very, very enriching. Very great to hear what you've just had to share with us. Uh, I will move on to the the third module that we have, uh, you know, in store for you today, which is uh, Vipassana as a broader transformation tool. So, uh, and uh, you know, so this this question is is about uh, Vipassana and uh, peace in our you know, in our very troubled world. So we've seen regions today that are fraught with war and conflict, such as the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis, and now, you know, more recently, the Israel-Hamas crisis. So how can Vipassana help us in building a ground will of peace? At an organization level, but I, I presume that, you know, trying to create an organization culture is relatively far easy than trying to create a culture at a global scale. So any any thoughts on this, uh, Bharaji? Chakriji, long back when I was in school, I forget which author I read, but that author broadly said, war is fought in the minds of men. So it is in the minds of men that seeds of peace must be sown. Mm -hmm. And beautiful. I mean, somewhere, you know, somebody is plotting this war, somebody is planning to kill some people. It's a very unhappy human being. Let let alone, I mean, the, the kind of damage he's causing to others, the kind of damage he's causing to himself while he's plotting all of that is something he's unaware of. And if you know, we had the good fortune to, of sending Hitler to a Vipassana program. He would have been a changed person. He would have been able to introspect. There have been cases, uh, you know, there's a real case of a person who was, who had taken a contract for murder in Bombay. And just before doing that murder, uh, uh, he was a contract killer. And uh, he decided to come for a Vipassana program. And uh, all through the program for the initial phase, he was extremely happy to attend the program because it was giving him a lot of uh, sharpness on a variety of ways that he could use to execute his job. Till actually he started doing Vipassana. And <clears throat> by the 10th day, there was such a transformation in him. He's a monk, by the way. He's become a monk today, quite like Angulimal. He was able to see the folly of his ways. He was able to see the pain that he was causing to himself. He was filled with moral dread and uh, suffering. With the way. Every time there was a thought of anger of wanting to hurt that person, there would be a sensation of a, a huge, huge amount of heat and pain that would permeate his body. And he suffered. Again, he picked up that thought. Again, he suffered. And he realized the strong connection between wanting to hurt others and the, the stress and tension in the body. You know, we... we when we don't meditate, we are not able to see it. There's a very big barrier which prevents us from noticing or recognizing what's happening within us. And that's what Vipassana breaks. So if any of these people who are, you know, planning conflict or indulging in violence were uh, 
to get a chance to attend a Vipassana program, this barrier breaks and you're able to see this connection. And therefore, very naturally, uh, you are able to generate thoughts of compassion, of goodwill, and it changes you. It changes you uh, not cosmetically, but from within there's a change. That's the transformation that happened with, even with King Ashoka. So to that extent, yes, uh, Shaktiji, all these conflicts that you're talking about, Ukraine, Russia, either because of fear or because of greed or because of hatred, the root cause is within us, within some powerful leader somewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that answer, uh, Bharji. Uh, I'm going to move to Aditya. And this is a question, you know, which uh, it's about... And, uh, you know, at, at Piramal Foundation, Aditya, you have taken, your organization has taken big bets on education, tribal health, upliftment of women in rural areas. And uh, how does Vipassana, for that matter, any meditation mindfulness practice help in transforming social systems? And a related question to this is, uh, you know, one from Arthi Wig from the Mamad Yunus uh, uh, Foundation. And she asked, is it possible to achieve the sustainable development goals without working on internal development goals? So how do we bring this into corporate India, into the social sector? How do we bring make this more pervasive? How can we transform social systems with the you know practices like meditation and mindfulness? Yeah, if I may the answer to that. I really have no clue. Uh, I'll tell you why we do it, right? Uh, I don't know about larger social systems. There's a reason why we as a leadership team made certain choices. Uh, we found that a lot of work that's happening in development happens for two, three reasons. Uh, one, it happens out of anger because something is not being given to a woman, something uh, tribal is not being treated well, a forest is being destroyed. Um, and so it comes out of anger that you want to do something. My own experience is that if you have anger, someone else has anger, I'm not sure the final solution is going to be a great idea. So anger, I don't think is a great thing. The other one comes from guilt that I have so much and others don't have. So I need to uplift women. I need to empower women and stuff like that. You know, so I need to uh, help a child with special needs. I need to help the poor. Um, I honestly, my personal experience is that guilt works up to this thing extent and then the human mind finds a way to shut out the guilt and not look in that direction um, and that's also not a consistent uh, performer for development uh, the third one is ego that uh, I worked on this and I changed and I helped you and uh, you know uh, again that's one thing but then as soon as the, but the ego keeps on needing more so then that also goes in a particular direction and the choices you'll end up making, in my view, are not necessary for the benefit of the individual, but it's for yourself. So I think development has to happen because of love, compassion, connection. Uh, it's a sense of service, seva. And right. uh, I think if we don't work on ourselves to remove anger, guilt, ego, uh, and then we're still doing the same action, I'm not sure it has as much benefit to the world around us. And I don't think that is sustainable. Uh, but that's my personal view based on my experience. Each person has their own view on this. Some people will believe that guilt is good. Some people believe ego is good. Some people believe anger is good. And that's the beauty of this world. Each of us has to live our own truths. Uh, so in, in the response to Aarti's question, I would have only one sustainable development goal, which is solve yourself. As soon as you solve yourself and you have compassion for people around you, everything else will get solved. But the SDGs are written in a particular context where people are still very uncomfortable speaking about work that I need to do with themselves. And imagine mm -hmm. that you have to change systems and therefore things will get solved. Right. I love one uh, statement by Gandhiji. He said, don't ever hope to design systems so good that people don't have to be good. And I think yeah, that's what the sort of SDGs are, right? So you're hoping that something will become like, but ultimately there's no choice. You have to work on yourself. You have to be more compassionate, caring. There is no choice. So 
Yeah, right. Sure. Right. So, in fact, there is an organization that has been set up, if I'm not mistaken, in Scandinavia or someplace called Inner Development Goals. And maybe Arthi is referring to that because uh, this outfit of IDG uh, came to the realization that wow. uh, the SDGs, hmm. uh, the SDGs are, are simply, uh, we, we're not going to be achieving them by 2030. Hmm. Uh, there's, uh, you know, based on, on the, our current track record, there's no way we're going to achieve them on 2030. So this organization has been doing a lot of introspection and figured that the real missing thing in SDGs is about values and about uh, in, internal self-development. Uh, so I suppose in the next version of the SDGs, we had the MDGs, now the SDGs. So maybe the next version is is a very different version. And uh, that's a great quote that you shared about Mahatma Gandhi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I realize we have so many questions and, and we, are, we are sort of short of time. So I'm going to just uh, try and zero down on, on the most relevant ones. Uh, this is a question for you, uh, Varaji. There's uh, so as a Vipassana meditator myself, I have realized the power of uh, Vipassana in the addiction. Now, is this the addiction capability restricted to just addiction? From uh, are we when we talk about the addiction, are we just talking about addiction to substances, or can we can we broaden this whole frame of the addiction to let's something like the fuels and the whole economic culture of convenience. Uh, what are the limits to this uh, de-addiction that uh, Vipassana is, uh, focuses on? You're on mute, Bharat. Long back during the times of the Buddha, there was this very rich person by the name Rathapal who becomes a monk. And, uh, you know, he's so wealthy, so wealthy that uh, people sit up and take notice that, hey, this guy, you know, this rich guy, maybe the Ambani Adani of those times has renounced and become a monk. So the king of that area calls him and says, Venerable Rathapal, uh, I have, this question has been in my mind for a long time. So can I ask you? So he says, sure. So he says that your father is so rich and you, you know, despite that, you quit and became a monk. So why? So Rathapal says, oh, King, can I ask you a question? So he says, sure. So Rathapal asks him tomorrow if you got a messenger saying from the East, oh, King, the king in the East, the kingdom in the East is weak. If you make slight effort, you can conquer it and add to your kingdom. Would you or would you not send an army? He says, yes, of course I would. The king is 80 years old. Huh? He says, okay. then having conquered it, you get another messenger from the West saying there is a kingdom to the West, which is weak. Would you or would you not conquer it? He says, of course I would do it. Then again, you get a messenger from the North. Would you or would you not? Yes. South. Yes. So, okay, now having completed this round, if another messenger comes again from the East saying, further to the East, there is a kingdom that you can conquer easily. Would you or would you not? He said, yes. So he said, where is the end to this? And the king is stunned by the answer. He says that, O oh, king, there is no end to greed. There is no end mm. to your wants. And hence, there is no end to suffering. You're gone. Even at this age, when you have, you say you have everything, and yet you are not satisfied, you still want to hanker after that additional peace. So, uh, when you talk about addiction, I think one of those uh, misnomer terms like education is addiction. We tend to think of addiction. Uh, to very gross substances like alcohol or cigarettes. Yeah. But right. alcohol is, uh, I mean, it's it's among the minor ones. The greater ones are the ones which come from ego, the addiction to power, the addiction to money, the addiction to, you know, self-image or projecting oneself. These are the more difficult ones. They are subtler, but far more powerful. And Vipassana is like a soap. I mean, when you apply soap, it it gradually weakens uh, all the dust that binds to the fabric. It right. uh, it works on all addictions, and I think these are the more useful uh, addictions. So, so I guess that you become a better human being. You de-addict yourself from anger, even from sorrow. All right, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. That is a very broad, encompassing uh, definition of addiction and what the practice can actually help. Uh, so I have a question for you, Dipya, and that is, uh, 
you know, in many of uh, S.N. Goenka's discourses, he refers to the welfare of all living sentient beings and not just humans. So at Piramal Foundation, you I also realize that you have a climate and sustainability division. Can you help us just connect the dots between meditation and the welfare of our biosphere? Yeah, I thought it's rather obvious. I mean, it's uh, we have a we basically created a world where we imagine human beings are super important and more important than everything else, right? And that is some training that I was given for some reason. It's taken me a long time. And I still don't think I'm able to unwind that training. Um, how do we decide that an earthworm is less important and human being is more important? Uh, when we're laying that highway, okay, we're laying it for the development. Okay, development of whom? Uh, and you say for the local rural community there. But what about the animals who are there? What about the trees that are there? Uh, we are not able to incorporate that into our thinking. And one of the most revolutionary things, I don't know whether you're aware of this, Shakti, but for example, uh, Chile has now a, a legislated law where lakes have voting rights, forests have voting rights, right? And uh, if lakes, forests, animals had voting rights, what choices would we be making? Uh, I think we'd be making very different choices uh, from yes. what we're making today. So uh, just because of the way we've mandated it, we have an anthropomorphic world, right? Which believes that human beings right. are personally are important and within that the male is even more important. So as we unwind that, I think Vipassana helps you understand that that's not such a great thing. <laughs> Everyone has a right to this planet. Uh, so yeah, so this work is a natural extension of that. In fact, it really hurts you every time you catch a flight. It hurts you as to what you're doing to the world around you. I live in Delhi, so I know what I'm doing to my atmosphere and therefore to myself. Right. So basically what you're saying, Aditya, this is all about self-realization. It's about consciousness. It's about realization. And uh, it's very interesting what you said because uh, just last month I was uh, at Navdanya at the Earth University attending a course by Vandana Shiva on uh, Earth democracy. And exactly what you just said about nature having its own rights in a democracy, we've also got to be able to extend those rights to uh, uh, to nature. So that is a question, which two audience questions that have come in the realm of health, personal health. And these are two questions, one which is from Ram. And another, which is from Rasik uh, Hulsogi, and, the, and you could maybe just combine the two and, and give an answer. And it's, uh, uh, it's a question that either or both of you can. And the question is about, can Vipassana help in reversal of diabetes? And uh, the other question uh, was about uh, someone who has undergone a major surgery and can that be, can, can Vipassana or meditation help in regaining one's health and to lead a disease-free life? Who, who, who would you like, us, like to answer no, no, this? That question? is definitely for Virat Kohli only. <laughs> so Bharaji, please start and Aditya can add if he has something to share. So I know when uh, when we have not attended a Vipassana program, we tend to have a very physical view of uh, ourselves. We tend to think of ourselves as this body. But as you attend Vipassana and you gradually grow in meditation, you realize that it's the other way around. We are less physical and more mental. The mind is far more important. And it's the mind that uh, influences and determines the shape and the state of the body. This physicality starts to become secondary. And you know, the doctors also kind of reinforce this. Biology reinforces this that, you know, uh, you, you've got this heart attack because of cholesterol, you've got this. And I'm not here to dispute any of those theories. But uh, if you go to the root of many of these, why is it that you're taking stress? Why, why is it that in your family, there are six people eating the same food, going through the same amount of physical environment, but why is it that you are suffering or you're diabetic, whereas your wife is not, your son, our daughter, mother are not? And when you ask these questions a little deeper, the doctors don't have an answer. 
But when you attend a Vipassana program, you realize that the source of your migraine, of your diabetes, of you know your uh, cardiac problems, etc., etc., originates from the stress that is being created by your mind, uh, minute to minute, second to second, and uh, some organs suffer because of some past conditions. I'm I'm not disputing, but. Uh, once you are able to see this happen, you are also able to realize that the calmer my mind is, the quieter my mind is, the less diseased my body will be. Because right. this equation is breaking. In in this physical, physical equation, there is no scope for the mind to do anything. When you have diabetes, you treat it at a physical level. But at the mental level, as you are meditating, your body heals. Now, having said that, it's a very important thing to remember that one shouldn't attend Vipassana courses to, uh, you know, solve diseases, either physical or mental. But because the moment you come to Vipassana to, you know, get rid of a migraine or to get rid of diabetes, it, gen it may not even work. You have that objective and it corrupts your thinking. You are not able to uh, work properly. But if you come with the intention of becoming a more peaceful human, to become more peaceful with yourself, automatically you start dissolving your stress. And as a byproduct, you tend to become more disease-free. So the moment you're able to let go this objective of being disease-free, automatically you will be able to meditate better. And as you're meditating better, it is not uncommon for a phenomenal amount of uh, physical gains to come. Phenomenal amount. Doctors who have come uh, with... Uh, Severe diseases have been shocked at the rapidity uh, of regression of their diseases, most of which in allopathy, uh, like for example, uh, it is very difficult for sciatica to be reversed. So if you have a doctor who's suffering with, from sciatica for the past 20 years, he doesn't even believe it's going to go away. And it's miraculous how it goes away at times in an hour or within one hour sitting. So these things happen. But you have to remember that it, this should not be the focus or purpose of a Vipassana meditation course. So that's a little tricky, right? To you know, you have an objective, but you can't come into a Vipassana program with that objective. You come in to receive whatever Vipassana has to offer to you, and then uh, so you're not really thinking about your result at the at the time you get into a Vipassana meditation, and just see that you know unfolding on its own, emerging. Right. So it's I, I would presume it'd be very difficult for many people, but it's a great insight. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you want to on 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 this question? No, no, Shakti, I'm not qualified at all for that. I am just a practitioner. I find it useful. That's all I know. All right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. So I'm going to move on to our fourth module, which is uh, the more general module. And I'm going to ask both of you, uh, you know, some questions. Uh, they are rapid fire, but this is not current Johar, Johar style rapid fire. So it's not a single word. But maybe in 30 to 40 seconds, if each of you and these questions are for, you know, for both of you, there are three questions. And if it just help us, for, you know, as to uh, to this the subject that we are discussing today. So the first question that I have, and it's for both of you, either of you can opt to you know take it first. Does the creation of agency necessarily require mindfulness, meditation, or vipassana? Mindfulness, yes. Mindfulness, meditation only. Not necessarily, but mindfulness, even without mindfulness meditation is fine. Many of us are naturally mindful because of past practice. So you may or may not be a meditator in the present sense. If you're lacking mindfulness, then meditation is a very good way to develop mindfulness. All right. Thank you. Uh, Aditya? No, these are all very complicated words for me. I don't know it enough to agency, mindfulness, all have loaded meanings. So. I have not spent the time to understand them deeply. Okay, no, no problem. We'll give that a pass. Then we'll move on to the the second second question. Uh, in your experience, have you ever seen a conflict between personal self transformation and societal transformation? 
Uh, can can personal self transformation ever get diluted if we bring societal transformation into the ambit? Is your views on this? Have, this I have a view on. <laughs> yes, please. I think it. I think this is exactly the opposite. I don't think you can do any social transformation till you've done the personal transformation. So I don't think it's limiting. I think it's enabling. Okay. Uh, because till you have clarity on what is happening on the world around you and what is actually happening inside you which is affecting the way you look at the world around you. You can't even start to act. So change starts happening the moment you have greater awareness of yourself. Right. right Nothing right. to do with what you do outside. Very, very well answered that. Very well answered. Yeah. Bharat, you know the logo of the Gandhi Fellowship, right? It's the Mobius strip. And the point is that there's an outside world with which you keep on working. But that's ultimately you have to work on the inside world. <laughs> the inside world is what morphs the outside world. We all think we are saving children. We are... Uh, you know, solving healthcare. The only thing that we are doing is saving ourselves. That's all. All right, great. So I'm going to move on to my final question as part of the rapid, uh, rapid question and answer. Uh, both of you have benefited from vipassana. Is it for everyone? I don't know how you will survive otherwise. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know what is the technically and politically correct answer, but I can't imagine you need some tool to control this mind, no? Yeah, okay, yeah. Don't use Vipassana, use something else, but you need something, no? It's like saying, without language, can I survive? Without maths, can I survive? Nobody asks that question. But without Vipassana, can I survive? Becomes a valid question. If peace and happiness are valid for everyone, then Vipassana is valid for everyone. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, both. I'm going to move now to uh, audience questions. As I told you, that we have many, many questions that we got from uh, our registrants who were given a chance to pose a question at the time of filling in a registration form. And we have come uh, here today. So I'm going to try and cover as many as we can. So uh, this is just strictly audience questions. The first one is from uh, Pragati Sani, who's a professor at Delhi University. Uh, is Vipassana more adept at identifying negative emotions than mindfulness? Are the two practices different or are these two stages in one's journey? Not, I think uh, not this is a question for you. Sorry. I said this is. I think this is a question for you. You want me to answer it? Uh, yes, yes, please. No, not in my understanding. I feel that vipassana makes you more self-aware, and if there are more negative emotions at that moment of time, you tend to feel that you know it is highlighting that. But that's not the case. I mean, there are times when uh, you are very happy. And if you were to meditate at that point in time, you would be, you would be able to observe happy emotions. The fact, however, is if you know what Kabir said, Dukh mein sumidan sab na koi. I sit to meditate when I'm tense and unhappy. So I tend to observe unhappiness more. And then I tend to think that that's who I am. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, this is now two questions combined into one. And I think, Aditya, you may, be, you may want to uh, step in here. And this is a question from uh, Tanuja Prasad and Radhika Bajaj, both from the US. And I've combined this. I've combined two questions into one. After attending a 10-day Vipassana session, what is the... Are there any recommendations on how one can prime oneself to establish a consistent meditative practice? Must disaster to ask me that question because I don't have a consistent practice. I, uh, I'm not the right person. I struggle. I mean, I, I really know that. I mean, the number of times I've come to the conclusion that there is no choice except this and this should be my first choice. And still right. three days later, not done it. Uh, it's just mind-boggling how my mind can make both those choices within 72 hours of each other. Uh, and so I've tried lots of tricks to play with my mind to, you know, to make sure you have an alarm. No, don't have an alarm. No, doesn't matter. Do it for 10 minutes. Do it for one minute. But the mind can play greater games than what my willpower seems to have. 
So, mm. uh, so uh, yeah. So I I just know that I just keep trying. That's all. And you just play the game with the mind. At least that's what I do. Probably not the right answer, and Bharat will have a better answer than me, hopefully. <laughs> Abharji? There is no intellectual answer which can, you know, overcome this. Uh, but the fact is that it is a very difficult uh, journey to daily practice. And I understand and I agree with Tanuja that it's going to be difficult. But for some people, there are people who have to con taken on to it and never let left it in their life. I know such people, several such people. But for most people, it's a struggle. It comes back to Praveen Sengar's original question that, you know, how do you uh, integrate this? But this, this is true for meditative practice and it's been known in India from, from generations. Uh, no matter which tradition you are from, you will find that you will come across these words. You know, once I heard, I was reading Lahiri Mahashay uh, and he was saying, his guru told him, Banat Banat Banjai. You know, imperceptibly, imperceptibly, slowly, infinitesimally by walking, you are becoming better, better, better. Your objections and your resistances is reducing. And we don't tend to realize it, but it happens. It's happened for me, certainly. I mean, for the first 10 years of my life, I could not do, I could not establish daily practice. And it was very frustrating. But uh, gradually, it's become more easy. It's becoming easier by the day. So, I mean, self-acceptance self and acceptance that, you know, this dichotomy is something that uh, is my reality. My mind is very weak. It wants to do it, but it does not have the strength to fight the remainder of my mind, which resists this very wonderful uh, task and mission of trying to do the good thing. So this struggle, this is the purest struggle between good and evil that's happening within your mind. The desire to sit down for a meditation session. And you can smile and accept, okay, I didn't sit again. I didn't sit again. Develop more awareness. And eventually, uh, you know, minute by minute. I think one, one technique that's helped me mm. is to integrate uh, Vipassana every, uh, you know, every incident to incident. That I find very easy, Bharat. But the morning sitting is what I struggle with. So before a meeting, I find it very easy to meditate for 10 minutes. Is that what you mean? Uh, not just 10 minutes, I'm saying for even, you know, two seconds. Let's okay. say you get two seconds and you just reflect back or, uh, you know, just just hmm. scan your body or maybe hmm. a sensation. The more, more you integrate this, getting up uh, early in the morning, just sitting on your bed before getting off, do 30 seconds, one minute. Before sleeping, if you can remember, just do it. These are small, uh, small pushes or nudges, which kind of help you, which make it easier for you to get up and sit on the cushion. Okay, so I'm at that stage where I'm able to do that very often. I'm able to do that five, six, ten times a day or so. The awareness, anapana, awareness, ten times a day I can do it. But the morning sitting for the one hour is what I still struggle with. Maybe it will come at some time. It will come. It will come. Yeah. And attend courses regularly. Maybe one day courses a week, one once every week, and a, mm -hmm. one course every year. I think this is a, this is a, if it is possible to attend a three or a four hour weekly session. That's another powerful push. Thank you. Lastly, Aditya, uh, companionship is uh, is very, very fundamental to success in meditation. If okay. you're surrounded by people who, who can support you in this, who can encourage you in this, uh, it helps. It creates an, uh, an atmosphere at work, at home, uh, you know, if loved ones are encouraging. It becomes easier because there is a lot of stress at both these places for all of us. My wife is the most disciplined meditator I know. She will not drop it for any reason. And I will walk <laughs> past her and close the door and we'll go and sit in the other room. So <laughs> the companionship is there. There is still my monkey mind. I, have to deal with. I can't blame it. My work environment is encouraging. My home environment is encouraging. <laughs> Everything is encouraging. I think there's a powerful sankhara that's coming out. And yeah, just... Hopefully. Yeah. So it's e it's easier said than done, but uh, still I know many people who are fairly regular at it. So re related, we have two questions, one from Sumesh uh, Urade and another from Shashikan Bhatnagar. Uh, very quickly, it's just related to what we're discussing right now. And Sumesh says, 
uh, I am feeling self is going down in different areas of my life. Can you tell me what is happening with me? And related to that, Shashi says, is there something very wrong inside me or is it just will or is it passion being uh, handled badly as it is normally an outcome of, or is it normally an outcome of serious attachment? So these are uh, meditators who are trying to get, uh, you know, why they're not able to inculcate that discipline into their lives. Any any uh, light that you can shed uh, on this, Bharatji? The question relating to confidence, I'd like to deal in person. Okay. Uh, I don't think it deserves a gentle answer here. All right. What was the other yeah. one? So, okay, I've already marked that as it was from, uh, it is from Ashikangar. Uh, and he says, and, and the question is related to his uh, not being able to, falling out of practice, right? So the question is, uh, is, a, is a question that he's posing to himself, but also to you, is there something very wrong with me that I'm not, that I'm falling out of practice? Or is it just will, or is it a passion being handled badly? Uh, or is it, is it an outcome of serious attachment? And this is, uh, so is this something that you would also like to take up on the group or, you know, one-on-one? -on -one? No, this is something which, uh, which is uh, very common. Very, okay. very. And I had myself gone to Guruji with the same question and Guruji uh, answered, Venkaji said that uh, passion is something which is uh, very fundamental and it's a huge enemy. So, it tends to overpower us. It tends to uh, it tends to grip us, but it can be beaten. Apart from the fact that it must be beaten, so all I can say is that you have to keep trying, and uh, you have to keep trying. And as you keep trying, accept it. Accept that you've fallen. You've done something which you're not happy with, and then keep moving on. Keep trying you will come to a point where very naturally you will be able to see the, I wouldn't say the eradication of passion, but uh, you would be much more in control of it. Yeah, thank you for that. I have one uh, final question. It's a very interesting question. Uh, it's uh, And then we will kind of wrap up and close. It's from Shiva Prasad Mudu, who works as an integration manager at SAP India. And he says, can the quality of meditation be meshed or cal calibrated for comparison with oneself from day to day for improvement? Day to day. Day to day would be an advanced stage, but over a longer span of time, one can. I mean, if you want to do even day-to-day, -day, the quality of your sitting, daily sittings can be a very good time to check is the is is the quality of your focus and concentration better? Are you able to focus your mind on smaller spots? And what about the quality of awareness? Uh, how many, how are you slicing time? Are you able to constantly be aware? Are you able to split a second into many, many micro segments and constantly be aware or you have general awareness in and out for a minute. So you can get a feedback daily from your daily meditation. But as you become better at meditation, you are able to uh, use subtler measures. For example, how often are you connected with your sensations? The more often you are connected with your sensations, especially during upheavals, for example, if there is uh, a potential conflict or something, how quickly do you come to your breath or your sensation? Those become more natural and you are able to step back. You are able to apologize more quickly, more readily without giving excuses and how quickly you are able to apologize, how fulsome is your apology, how quick and fulsome is your appreciation. These are some, uh, some aspects which start becoming more manifest. So if this is happening, then yes, on a day-to-day -day basis, you get cues that you are improving. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bharaji and, and Aditya. See, there are many more questions. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to, uh, you know, answer all of these. Uh, so uh, there is, I want to just remind you that there is a WhatsApp group that, uh, you know, that, sorry, not a WhatsApp group, a group on Telegram that has been created by, uh, by Bharaji. And uh, if you have any questions, please post them on that, uh, on that Telegram chat, and uh, we will try and answer these questions. Uh, there are very many other interesting questions, and, and it is only for a want of time that we haven't been able to answer uh, all questions. Uh, we are both at the very, very close of uh, the session. So I want to thank each and every one of you from, you know, whichever part of the world you have in, you know, for coming in and being on this, uh, uh, you know, on this webinar today, we've had a great response. And uh, I think just judging by the quality of questions that we've got and, and the answers, this has been a very enriching uh, conversation. And I want to thank all our attendees, all our participants, and uh, to you, Bharachi and, uh, and and Aditya, both of you. Uh, as a token of my appreciation, uh, Bharachi and Aditya, I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have planted five saplings in, in your name uh, with the Sankal Taru uh, Foundation, and uh, you will get an email from them tomorrow on the conf on the confirmation that these, the location of where these saplings have been have been planted. So I, I really appreciate your taking the time out here for uh, just as by way of a wrap up, there was also a question in the in the chat, this session has been recorded and everyone who registered for this session, whether you attended it or not, you will get a link within a week from zoom, which will have a link to the recording. Yeah, I will also try and put in the link of the of the chat and, uh, you know, so and maybe just add a few more resources. So please look out for this email from Zoom that you will get, you know, within a week's time. Yeah, so once again, I want to thank, uh, thank you all, you know, for taking out the time. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the very best. And as uh, Goenkaji Guruji would say, be happy be in your path and in your journey all the way yeah thank you all thank you thank you Aditya. thank you shakti ji and thank, thank you to you everyone in the audience your presence was very was very motivating thank you